Praise the Lord. 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 God bless you, precious people. People of God. Greatest people in all the world. I intend to spend the rest of my life among them and then have eternity before me with them. God's people. God's own precious jewels. I wish you knew how much he loves you. I wish you knew. I may try to tell you before this camp's over. Would you stand with me, please? And we'll introduce our thought for you tonight. <clears throat> Praise the Lord. 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 I'm going to read two verses of Scripture from the 15th chapter of 1 Samuel, verses 13 and 14, and it's going to open up an incident to you, and I'm going to preach from these verses or the thoughts that I get from this passage tonight. And Samuel came to Saul, and Saul said unto him, Blessed be thou of the Lord, I have performed the commandment of the Lord. And Samuel said, What meaneth then this bleating of the sheep in mine ears? and the lowing of the oxen, which I hear. Now, you Bible scholars, that's opened up something to you. I'm going to speak tonight from this thought, the far-reaching effects of Saul's incomplete obedience. Don't misunderstand my sermon topic. I am not preaching from the disobedience of Saul. I'm preaching from the far-reaching effects of Saul's incomplete obedience. And I'm going to truthfully say from this pulpit tonight, Saul came so near being obedient until he thought he had. He was, he was no hypocrite in these verses that I read to you. He came so near being obedient until he thought he was. And I wonder if there's any among us that are very sincere in their thoughts that they are obedient when there is some incomplete obedience in their life. Very, very, very provoking thoughts. And don't forget the subject. Far-reaching effects. It went way back, and then it went into the distant future of his incomplete obedience. God bless you. You may be seated. Don't read it now, but you can later. Begin with the first verse of this chapter, and you will find Samuel reminding Saul of the day that he anointed him king over Israel. And then he told Saul, 
God has spoken to me and told me to tell you, King Saul, to mobilize you an army, and you invade Amalek and completely and all together destroy all of the Amalekites. He, he, he even went into saying the women, the children, the sucklings. That means don't leave one Amalekite alive. From babies on to the oldest adults. Then all of their spoil. That meant every living thing that they owned. God wanted the Amalekites completely annihilated from this world, destroyed off of it, no longer a nation or a people. And I'm going to say there was a cause. It was because. We go way back into the history of Israel in route to Canaan's land. And we find the Amalekites constantly opposing them. They were they're just one of their number one enemies gave Israel so much trouble. And 400 years before this occasion that I read to you, Moses was leading the children of Israel to Canaan's land. And the Amalekites met them, and they were in war. And Moses told Joshua one evening, Early in the morning you be down in the valley with our soldiers, our army, and you meet the Amalekites. And I'm going up on the hillside, and I'll watch the battle from the hilltop. The next morning, Joshua had the Israelites down in the valley, as Moses instructed. And the battle started between the Israelites and the Amalekites. It wasn't the kind of battle that you would read about today. It was far from nuclear warfare, bombs and what have you. It was just man to man, fist to fist, club to club, sword to sword, just battling it out, man and man, man and man. And the battle continued with no success, seemingly. And after a while, Moses on the hilltop watching the battle, he lifted up his hands. I don't find nowhere where he was told to. I don't find it. But he lifted up his hands. And the very moment Moses lifted up his hands, Joshua and the Israelites began driving the Amalekites back. They're defeating them. They're driving them back. Moses standing on the hillside with his hands up. He held them up, and as long as they were up, Joshua is winning the battle. He's winning the battle. Moses' hands are up. And I'm going to repeat again, as long as they were up, Joshua and the Israelites are defeating the enemy, driving the enemy back. But who can hold their hands up? forever, no longer than mine has been up. I feel kind of like i got a brick in each hand, 
and they're crying to come down. Get off some time and hold yours up and see how long you can hold them up before your arms begin to get weak and want you to drop them down by your side. Moses just held them up long as he could, and Joshua was driving the enemy back. But finally, Moses could hold them up no longer. Down his hands came. And the very moment that his hands came down by his side, the battle reversed in the valley. The Amalekites began to regain all that they had lost. They began driving Joshua and the Israelites back. And they continued to drive them back. Continued, continued. Moses' hands are down by his side. After a while, after they rested a little bit, he lifted them again. And the very moment he lifted them up, the battle reversed in the valley. The Israelites began driving the Amalekites back. And Moses kept his hands up, and as long as they were up, Israel is winning the battle. And he kept them up long as he could again, and down they come. And the moment they come down, battle reverse. The Amalekites begin to drive the Israelites back. It was soon determined. It was soon clearly understood that it's not so much those in the valley fighting and battling. It's where their leader's hands are. I wish I could leave that forever in your thinking. There isn't a single one of us but what want a victory. I cry for a victory. And I'm going to tell you, saints, I don't care too much for the victories that you grit your teeth and close your eyes and clap your hands and finally pretend to have by patting your foot. I want a victory that comes down from the heavens above. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. In other words, a God-given victory. Praise the Lord. It'll last longer than midnight on Sunday night. People that pray through in a God-given victory will be back the next service night. But those victories that you kindly make yourself, whether it's there or not, you try to make it, you try to get somebody through by helping them talk in tongues, they probably won't be back Wednesday night. But God give me Holy Ghost, real, genuine victories. And I'm going to tell you folks, that's what your district, Connecticut, needs. And not just Connecticut. Louisiana needs it. Texas needs it. The United Pentecostal Church needs it. A God sent, God given victory. And I'm going to mention again it was soon determined, it could be seen that it's not necessarily those that are down there in the valley doing the fighting, but it's where their leaders' hands are. When they're up, Israel is winning. When they're down, the enemy is winning. When they're up, Israel is winning. When they're down, the Amalekites are winning. Hold them up, Moses! Keep them up! Keep them up! 
Well, how long can you expect a man to keep them up? And there was two men. Thank God for men that can see a few things. Thank God for people that can see a few things. Can see a few needs. Nobody tells them. I preach, I preach uh, one time, maybe two times, I don't know. Could have been three, I guess. All of these years. But on the thought of the unwritten precept. Unwritten. Can't find nowhere where it's written or spoken. And I'll challenge you to tell me who told David to kill Goliath. Who told him? We're all waiting to be told. And we've got to be begged. And will you please? How many of you will? Gods are looking for people that can see a need. Look at the confidence he had in the man that owned the colt. That's the reason that man owned the colt. And the reason I didn't own it. The reason you didn't own it. He told those disciples, untie that colt. And if the owner of that colt says anything to you about why you're untying him, just tell that man I have need of him. That's the Lord's confidence in the man that owned the coat. Can he have that much confidence in me and you that we can just see the need, praise God, and we do it? Oh, we see it and go tell the pastor. Go tell, get on a telephone, call some of the saints and say, you know, such and such needs to be done. I wonder why the Lord told you it needed to be done. I was given an altar call one night in an evangelistic service. A couple in the church brought a, a neighbor couple with them that never had been there before. And I was given the altar call, and the husband of this young couple that was in the church, he came down the wall and up on the platform and came up behind me and said, Don't look, Brother Glass, but that couple that's sitting with Gloria and I, I believe they'd come to the altar if you'd go back there and speak to them. I turned around to him. I said, I wonder why God had to tell you to come up here and tell me. God told you to speak to them. You get back there and speak to them. Don't try to pass the buck. Do it yourself. He went right back there and spoke to both of them. They came to the altar and were baptized that night. He was trying to get me to do what God told him to do. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I tell, I tell precious saints that tell me things that they think I ought to do. I tell them, I still get my mail from the glory world. God still talks to me. Praise the Lord. I don't need you to tell me what to do. I'm supposed to tell you what to do. Two men, two men saw that. Two men saw that. That's recorded in the Scripture. I don't know how many others saw it, but I, don't, I know there's only two that really acted on it. They saw it. They saw it. Nobody told them. They recognized it. They went and got them a stone. And they brought that stone and placed it right behind where Moses was standing. And one got on one side of him and one on the other. 
and they set him down on that stone. Then Aaron got over here on this side or one side and held this hand up. And her, he got over here on the other side and held this hand up. And with Moses' hands up, being held up by others, Joshua won the battle. Praise the Lord. Now, I'm going to be as honest with you precious people as I know how, and I'm not going to, I don't want to sound like I'm bragging. God forbid, God forbid, I haven't got a thing in the world to brag about. Nothing. Or I can be thankful for what God has done for me. But in these 53 years of gospel preaching, I've been through every state in our union. I've been through six provinces of Canada. And Sister Glass counted 29 foreign mission fields preaching this precious gospel that's my very life. It's my heartbeat. I, I just I feel so bad that I can so see my strength and my efficiency diminishing to the extent that I'm going to soon have to quit. I don't want to quit. I love it. I love the souls I preach to. I love the gospel I preach. I love the Savior I represent. I love the church I'm in. But I'm telling you that to tell you this. I have noticed wherever I have gone, and I've gone into some of the liveliest churches you could ever put your foot in. And I've gone in some of the deadest you ever put your foot in. I've gone to some of the liveliest, largest districts in our organization and preached camp after camp. And I've gone, I don't call them, I've gone to some of our smaller and I've preached camp after camp. And I'm going to tell you people this, not just from Scripture, but from experience. Wherever I have gone and found the people that was lifting their leaders' hands up, holding them up, their pastors and their officials, they were behind them, holding their hands up. I'll show you a people that's having revivals. I'll show you a people whose friends are getting saved. I'll show you a people whose children are getting saved. They're moving on from victory to victory to victory to victory. And then I'll take you places where they're pulling their ha leaders' hands down. Churches are not doing anything to support their pastors, working against them, criticizing them, finding fault with everything they do. I'll show you a dead church, and I'll show you saints whose children are backsliding. In fact, the saints themselves are backslid. They've just been in the church so long, they just keep it going because they're so habited to going. But your children are not going to do that. You need to set your church afire. And you can do it. You can do it. You can do it. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Hold your leader's hands up. Get them 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 up. I'm so glad I can say this. I can say it in the highest place in all the world that a man can stand in, and that's the pulpit where the unadulterated gospel is preached. I can say this, Brother Davis, with my head up and with a loud, clear voice, 
that all the Pentecostal world could hear me. Not one single human being has ever heard me say aught against one of our leaders. Not one single word, not one. I hold their hands up. Every leader I've ever had, right now, while I preach to you, the three leaders in my district, I baptized them. I baptized them. Brother Tenney is district superintendent. He came up in my church, baptized him when he was a sophomore in high school. He got the Holy Ghost. I'm the only pastor he ever knew. And today, no one ever hears me say, Tom. No one ever hears me say, Son. He is my leader. He is my district superintendent. And I don't care if I am old enough to be his daddy. I respect him as my leader. Praise God. Praise God. Praise the Lord. He called me here. He called me here a few months ago. And he said, Brother Glass, we have a church in the district that has voted down seven preachers. And he said, I just told them tonight. He called me Wednesday night after church. And I was over in Texas preaching. He said, I told them tonight that I would have you here Saturday night and that you would stay with them three months and give them a little breathing spell. He said, I called a Taft Hartley act on them. Going to not let them talk about a preacher for three months. And I want you to be there Saturday night and be interim pastor. And after three months, we have begun talking about a pastor. I said, Brother Tenney, I've got a ticket at home from Brother David Gray in San Diego, California. I'm supposed to be there next Tuesday night. He said, I'll take care of that. I'll take care of that. You do what I tell you. And then I told him some other appointments I had. I'll take care of that. This is a desperate need, and these are men of God, and they'll understand. And God bless your heart, I was in De Quincey Saturday night. And I stayed there three months because my leader told me to. Praise God. I could have, I could have pulled seniority on him. Why, well, boy, I baptized you. You're not telling me what to do. Yes, he is telling me what to do. Sir, I recognize God-ordained authority. It's God I'm dealing with and not necessarily Brother Tenney. So I'm going to hold his hands up. Praise the Lord. And that worked out so well, he called me four more times for four more churches. I'm hoping he don't call me while I'm up here and tell me to cancel out this count and come home. It sure would be hard to do. It'd be hard to do. It'd be hard to do. Then his secretary, the secretary of the district, I baptized him. Baptized him. And I don't, I don't refer to him as C.E. That's his name, C.E. Jr. I call him Brother Cooley. Respect him as my leader. Then our oldest son is my pastor. I'm a member of that church. He's my pastor. And do you know, I talked it over with him about whether to come up here or not. And you can laugh at this if you want to, but he knows this. If he'd have told me no, I wouldn't be here. Now you go on and talk against your leaders and run them down and, and, and fail to cooperate with them if you want to. There is a people in this world that respects God-ordained leadership. 
I want to go to heaven. I don't want to just go to camp meetings. I'm not just interested in going to revival services. I've got heaven as my goal. And I want to make glory world. I'm going to tell you this. I don't want to fail to tell you. that not a one of these leaders needs you. influence. God bless you. You don't know what battles they fight. I told somebody the other day, my oldest son was a preacher and about 20, 23 or 4 years ago, the youngest son was to visit us in Tennessee, be there over the weekend. He had local license. He was in church in Baton Rouge playing the piano and organ, and his wife, a Sunday school secretary. They both had good jobs. They, they each had a car that's paying for a little brick home and had two sweet little children. And he was coming to visit us over the weekend. And I got a long-distance call from him. He said, Dad, he said, Brother Cannon, superintendent of the Arkansas district, has called me. And he wants me to go to Lone Oak, Arkansas and preach Sunday there without a pastor. And he wants me to consider it. Why didn't you shout, Brother Glass? Just listen to me and I'll tell you why. I'll be happy to tell you why. He said, Dad, what you think about it? I said, well, now, if you was talking to me about thinking about another job or moving or something... I'd give you my opinion, but you're talking about something that pertains to God. And my advice to you is hear from God. Hear from God. Don't, don't let Dad tell you what to do. You've got to do it after you get there, and you're going to need God, so you better talk to Him. And he decided to go. And uh, some of the folks in the church, I was a pastor and found it out that he was at Lone Oak, they were trying him out. Trying him out. And you don't know how that ate on me. Trying my boy out. Trying him out. Try me out if you want to, but leave my children alone. Leave them alone. But uh, he went, and he, he got up before that audience, and I know they were staring holes through him. Just like somebody going to buy an old mule to farm. And I told a church one time, I'd preach there many times, and, and they called me back to talk to me about being the pastor, not to try me out. But I let them know this, and I got in the pulpit. I said, take a good look at me. Look me over from head to foot. But you keep in mind while you're looking me over and wondering if you want me, I'm looking you over wondering if I want you. It works both ways. God bless our preachers. Some of the church that Sunday, my face was so long. I can't forget one of the board members and his wives came to me and said, Brother Glass, what's the matter? You look so unhappy. He said, one of your sons is pastoring the church and been pastoring for several years. and Now it looks like your other son's going into pastoral work. You ought to be the happiest man in all the world. 
I said, but brother and sister Jackson, that's what you know about pastor. Churches will elect you today and want to unelect you next Sunday. They're for you today and against you tomorrow. You can't please all of them. You can't do it. Can't do it. No one man can please an entire congregation. Can't do it. Impossible. I was called to Texas Bible College to, to, to speak to prospective preachers. You had to be called to preach to be in my class. I taught them for four months. Pastoral, uh, pastoral theology from an experimental standpoint. Had to be a prospective preacher to be in that class. And I told every one of them, I doubt seriously if you're ever elected in a church a hundred percent. A hundred percent. And after you're elected, You'll not be able to please all the people. The people don't please themselves. Some of the ladies will go buy a dress and come home, try it on, and not like it, and take it back and see if they won't give them their money back. Men will do the same thing. You go to church, you'll see a Pontiac, a Buick, a Ford, an Oldsmobile. They don't all like the same kind of a car. You go inside the church and one lady's got on a red dress, the other one a blue one, the other one a white one. One man's got on a black suit, the other a gray suit, the other a blue suit. Every one of them's sitting on a different side. One works over here and one over here. But they all go to one church and expect one little old pastor and his wife to please every one of them. Can't do it, folks. And you know what I always preach to the church I pastored? If you people, if you people knew what a little time I spend trying to please you, you'd be very unhappy. I don't spend no time at all trying to please you. I can't please all of you. Why try to please one of you? So I tell you what I do. I do my very best to please God. To please God. And if that don't please you, I just don't have no apologies for it. Praise the Lord. How many of you want your family saved? You got loved ones you won't save. You want to be in a lively church, a church on fire. I'm telling you how to have it. I'm telling you how to have it. How to defeat the enemy. How to drive him completely off the battlefield. Just lift your leader's hands up. Praise God. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Oh, glory. I'm not supposed to preach this hard. And that's something I, I didn't do for 48 years. Drank water in the pulpit. I'm glad I never did preach against it. I just didn't do it. Well, after the battle is over, the smoke is cleared away, Joshua and the Israelites come marching off the battlefield with victory, God speaks to Moses. And he told Moses, I want you to rehearse this in the ears of Joshua. 
I am going to wipe the Amalekites off the face of the earth. They will no longer be a people. Now, Moses, you rehearsed that in the ears of Joshua. And Moses, of course, did. Well, if God promises to do that, why didn't he do it? The next day. He didn't wait till the next day. He did it that day. In his day. In his day. Not in Moses' day. It was 400 of our years before God spoke to Samuel and told Samuel to tell Saul to keep his promise he made to Moses and told him to rehearse it in the ears of Joshua. Four hundred years. It takes a little patience for you to serve God and wait on Him, but He'll never break a promise, never break one. He'll keep it. Wait, wait, wait. Wait on the Lord. Wait on the Lord. He'll keep His promise. I sometimes think about the morning He told Peter, after Peter had put his net away, mended it, cleaned it, and put it away. And Jesus said, launch out into the deep and let down your net for a catch. Now, I know in Peter's mind, my, my, I've already cleaned my net. I put it away. That's, he, he's got that in his mind. Why didn't he come at 3 o'clock this morning when I was out there letting that net down? i tell you why I didn't, Peter. He comes in his time. In his time. Not your time. His time. His time. And he may come at a time that makes it a little harder on you. I don't know. He could have caught Peter fished all night. He said, oh, I've fought all night and caught nothing. And he wasn't fishing for a hobby. He was, he was a commercial fisherman. He had businessmen waiting for fish, and he hadn't caught any. And he said, I've been toiling all night, and that pricked him in the heart. He said, nevertheless, at thy word, I will let down the net. Now, God came in his time. And I'm going to tell you, friends, he's going to do things for us in his time. And it's up to us to be faithful and loyal, lift our leaders' hands up, and watch God win the battle. I want Him to win the battle, not me. I can't win it, and if I could, it wouldn't last. Four hundred years later, God spoke to Samuel and told him to tell Saul to get him an army, mobilize him an army, and go out and destroy all the Amalekites, all their spoil, destroy the men, women, children, sucklings, and all their spoil, wipe them off the face of the earth. Saul got his army. Got 210,000 men. And I like this about Saul, and I'm going to commend him for it. I can't see where he was told to do this, but he did it. And, and, and I appreciate it. I do. Living among the Amalekites at that time were some people known as the Kenites. Now, don't let me lose you in these ites. Please don't. I'm sincere in my preaching to you tonight. 
And Saul issued a proclamation to the Kenites. And this was it. We're going to give you a certain length of time to come out from among the Amalekites. The Amalekites are doomed. They're going to be destroyed. But the Kenites were friendly toward our forefathers when they were going into Canaan's land. They favored our forefathers. They were kind to them. And we don't want to destroy you among the ones that were our forefathers' enemies. So we're giving you time to come out from among them. Oh, I wish the friends we have to our church that's been kind to us, been friendly with us, they even have supported our churches to a certain extent. I wish they'd come on in the church and get out of the world. This world is doomed. It's doomed. And I'll tell you what the pulpit's crying, just begging you to come on out of this doomed world. Come on out. The world is going to pass away with a lust thereof. For he that doeth the will of God shall abide forever. We want you to come out of the world. One writer said, one writer said, Come out from among them. Be not partakers of her sins and receive not of her plague. If you stay in the world and you are a partaker of her sins, you're going to receive of her plagues. But come out of her. Come on out. Come out. Come on out. Come on out. That is kind of Saul to issue that proclamation. And according to the Scripture, the Kenites came out from among them, separated themselves from the Amalekites. I wish you that are here tonight unsaved, I wish you'd do that. I wish all the friends of the church in Connecticut would do it. I wish all of them in Louisiana would do it. We've got friends, and I thank God for our friends. I shook hands with one one day and looked at him in the eye, and my eyes filled up with tears, and I gripped his hand, and I said, Friend... I hate to tell you this. You're too good a man to go to hell, but you're not saved to go to heaven. That cut that man's heart out to the altar. He went and got saved. We've got him like that. We've got him. And after the Kenites separated themselves, Saul waded into the Amalekites and the Scripture says He slew them from Havilah to Shear. If you study the Scripture, you'll find that's from one end of the country to the other. He had enough evidence to show you that He had obeyed the Lord. He could take you up on this mountaintop or hilltop and say, Look down this hill. Look down this hill. And there is slain Amalekites. There is slain spoil, camels, oxen, cattle, sheep, asses, whatever they own. They're slain. The valleys are full. The hillsides are covered. Now look down this side. I've got all the evidence I need to prove to anyone that I've obeyed the commandments of the Lord. And some of us can go to church and we're dressed modest. Look at me. I'm dressed modest. I, 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 I know I am. <laughs> you don't. You don't never see cufflinks on me. I, I'm not. I don't preach against them. I just don't wear. Them. You don't see a tie tack. And I'll be a preacher 
Monday, just like I am Sunday. And I, I'm looking at modest dressed ladies, long hair, modest dresses. I believe in that. Don't, don't come to me with your cut hair and trying to get me to endorse it. I can't do it. I didn't get many amens. Oh, sir. Oh, sir, I believe in our old standard of holiness, just like we've always preached. I believe in it. I believe in it with all of my heart. All of my heart. But we've got too many people, their obedience is only in their mind. That night, God woke Samuel up. God bless you patient people. I'll love you after I'm gone. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Sometime during that night, God woke Samuel up. And I'm going to tell you, dear angel saints, I know what it is to be awakened at night. God woke Samuel up and said, I regret. I wish I never had of anointed Saul, king of Israel. I wish I never had. I repent that I did. You know, brethren, sometimes I wonder if God looks at me and says, I wish I never had a call to Him. Reckon He ever looks at you and said, I wish I'd have left Him out there. Look at the trouble they cause in my little church. Instead of being a blessing to it, look at the trouble they cause. When they make calls to people, it's not to invite them to church, it's to talk against the church. I wish I'd have left them alone. I repent that I ever, ever called them and filled them. That's what he told Samuel about Saul. Samuel got up, wept, walked the floor, laid on the floor. I know what that is. I've been awakened at night and there's somebody's face in mine, right in my mind, that they have failed God, that they are failing the Lord, they're delinquent and I, I go to another part of the house to keep from waking my dear wife up and get out on the floor, pound the floor and beg God and cry and weep. And they're, they're over at home snoring sound asleep. And the next day they're eating and drinking and I'm fasting and praying for them, doing everything in the world I can to get them back right with God. And, and they're not giving a thought to it. Saints, that's that way. That's what your leader goes through. Next morning, Samuel went out to meet Saul, and I read it to you. Saul said, Blessed be thou of the Lord. I have kept the commandments, or I have performed the commandments of the Lord this day. And about that time, some sheep began bleating. Whatever it is, it'll tell on you. It'll tell on you. You may have it fenced in, hid out. And Samuel said to Saul, Then what means the bleeding of these sheep and the lowing of these oxen that I hear? They're supposed to be dead. They're some of the spoil of the Amalekites. Well, 
he just like the average person, he tried to justify himself. The people, the people. I wish I could preach an hour on that. The people, people. If you make heaven, you're going to have to overcome people to do it. People. People. Not just the theater. Not just the dance hall. Not just the beer garden. You're going to have to overcome people. Who was it blind Bartimaeus had to overcome? Somebody that told him to hush. Why was Zacchaeus up a tree? People. Why did the woman with an issue of blood have to press her way through to get to Christ? People. Why was the man sick of the palsy let down through the roof of the building? People. Everyone has to overcome people to serve God. Are you going to let people send you to hell? God bless your heart. I'll say this is more people wanting you to go to heaven than they are wanting you to go to hell. I'm just stirred up, brother. I'm not going to hurt you. <laughs> Don't let people send you to hell. I guarantee you there's somebody in this audience tonight that would live for God if it wasn't for some people. They know. Justified himself. These people wanted me to offer it for sacrifice. And then the Lord let him know that to obey is greater than sacrifice. You can't make a sacrifice that'll substitute for obedience. You can't do it. You can't do it. Now, to my text. Samuel lets all know the crown's going to be taken away from you and given to another family. Now look at the far-reaching effects. It went back 400 years and broke a promise God made to Moses and said, Rehearse it in the ears of Joshua. Now, when you break your promises, that's you. But when you start tampering with the promise of God, you can get yourself into some serious trouble. My God is not slack concerning His promise. And when you start tampering with the promise of God, God promised Moses and told him to rehearse it in the ears of Joshua. And now, 400 years later, he's honored a man. Oh, what honor he's bestowing upon King Saul that I'm calling him, I'm sanctifying him to keep a promise I made to faithful Moses and Abraham 400 years ago. And Saul was a sad, bitter disappointment to God. It went back. Far-reaching effects. Now, look into the future. Look into the future. The throne was taken from him. The crown was taken off of his brow. You know who would have wore that crown as the next king of Israel had Saul have obeyed the Lord? His own son, Jonathan, would have been the second king. Saul, can you pay that price? Are you ready to pay that price? Dad's you that God's talking to, calling and encouraging to live for Him. Are you ready to pay that price? 
Saul's grandson, Jonathan's son, would have been the third king. His great-grandson would have been the fourth king. But God has removed the crown and the position from his entire household. Anointed David king, and in less than 40 years, David wondered if there's one more living soul that belongs to Saul's family. And he made an appeal. Does anybody anywhere know of anyone that's connected with Saul's household because of his incomplete obedience? His entire family is wiped off of the earth. And somebody told him, said, David, down in Lodibar, there is one son of the family by the name of Mephibosheth. He's lame. His nurse dropped him when Saul's family was destroyed. Dropped him and crippled him and picked him up and took him on. He's down in Lodibar. Go bring him here. I'm going to let him eat at my table and restore unto him everything that Saul ever possessed. But Saul, what a price. What a price. Are you mothers and dads ready to pay that price? Are you? I'm going to conclude by uh, turning over to page two. And just show you what a far-reaching effect it has for the people that serve God. Now, you've heard of the state of Louisiana, the great district there. We just closed the camp meeting, and I preached in the morning services in the camp there. The last four years. But I told Brother Tenney this, this is the last one. Estimated at 10,000 people there. There's over 600 preachers in the state of Louisiana. 300 churches. And we have, I heard it said, you have about 3 million in Connecticut. That's just about our population. We have more square miles than you have. And my angel mother was the first lady ever baptized in Louisiana in the name of Jesus. And if there ever was a lady that later on in life struggled and battled to serve God. She did. She was the mother of 11 children. I'm the second child, family of 11. Eight boys and three girls, and I'm the oldest boy. Lived out in the country. You people don't know what that is. Long time ago, before very many people had automobiles and one that had them wished they didn't. That's the truth. Couldn't go to town four miles without having a flat. We had a one-horse wagon, called it a hack, and somebody asked me what was a hack. And had an old horse named Nip, and we lived four miles from church. And my father wanted my mother to go to church when she wanted to go, but he didn't want her to want to go. He wouldn't keep her from it. She wanted to go to church. George, I was the oldest boy. Hit your old nip up this afternoon and take your mother to church. And every time the lights is on, she wanted to be there. And he was no babysitter. He didn't stay with the rest of the children. The ones that was born then, that's before some of them was born, she had to get every one of them ready and put them in the back of the hack. Buggy couldn't take them. Too many. And we'd go to church. She'd lead the singing. 
She led the singing in the first revival ever conducted in Louisiana. She's, she's leading the singing then. Prayed in the altar. She didn't leave church till everybody else left. Then she'd take, tell me, go put old Nip to the hack and bring him to the back door and let's get these children up off of these pallets and get them home. What a job. What a job. If ever a woman, seemed to me like, had a reason or an excuse to stay away, she had it. Not a one of her people family saved. Not a one. But that dear angel held on to God and lived to see every single one of her children saved. Lived to see her husband saved. <clears throat> And tonight, tonight there is six glass preachers, all her descendants. Three sons, two grandsons, and one great-grandson. All preaching the gospel tonight. All because she held on far-reaching effects. No end to it. No end to it. She has grandchildren, granddaughters that married preachers. Oh, brother. You look at me. I'm 76 years old. I'm a third generation of Pentecost. There's two before me and two after me. I'm the middle link in the five generations. You think I'm going to break that chain? No! Praise the Lord. Say, friends, do you want to be saved? Do you want a victory? Do you want God in your midst? I've told you how to have it. I've told you how. That's God's way of giving you a glorious victory. Far-reaching effects. If your being lost only affected you, it'd be bad enough. But there's young girls in this service tonight. Getting saved may mean your family, when you have one, will be saved in the church. But if you don't, it could mean your unborn posterity will go to hell with you. I'm preaching truth tonight. Praise God. Praise God. Praise the Lord. There might be somebody here tonight that's not in a link. There's just no chain in your thing. Why don't you become the first link? Why don't you start a chain in your family and let it just go down? Even after you're dead and gone, that chain will continue. Continue. Three or four of these preachers is called after mothers already in eternity. These preachers are still being called, preaching the gospel going on. Praise the Lord! Praise the Lord! Praise the Lord. Let's stand up and worship our God tonight. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Glory, 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 glory. I want every, every everyone can't. Everyone can't. Everyone can't. So you that don't want to, you just don't come. You just don't come. I, I talk straight, don't I? Well, that's just the only way I know how. There's not room for everybody down here, so what's the use for you that don't want to come and pray to come? What's the use? 
But everyone in this building that wants to live in a good, lively, thriving church where people are getting saved, and, and, and some of your own kin folks is going to get saved, and, and you're going to lift up the hands of your leader, your pastor, your neighbor's pastor, and your superintendent, and your secretary, and your presbyter. You're, you're just going to hold up hands in, in, in God's kingdom. I want you to come down here hurriedly and pray with me a while. Come on. Now, you that are not intending to do it, you stay back there and repent, please. Don't kneel. It'll take up too much space. Let, 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 let everybody come in. Get close. Get close. Get close. Though our sins are scarlet, You have made us white as snow. Though our sins are scarlet, you have made us white as snow. I know a place where mercy flows. Take the stains, make you whiter than snow. Like a tide, it is rising up deep inside a current. That moves and makes you come alive Living water that brings the dead to life Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one.